First level spells are among the most important spells in the game. They are foundational to your character. Aside from cantrips, these are the first spells that you will ever get to pick in the game. They're also some of the first things that a new player will be looking through as they decide how to steer their character for their upcoming adventure. Ensuring that these spells serve their purpose, that they feel thematic, and provide enough relative power to sell their fantasy while not being overpowered when compared to their cost is a really important thing to get right, as there's no spell slot in the game that you can't use these with. What I'm saying is that they provide their own unique challenges when it comes to design. Given that they arrive straight at the beginning of the game, it wouldn't be hard to make a spell that could completely undermine entire encounters or other elements of the game at that stage. Simply put, they can't be too strong since they shouldn't be crowding out higher level spells, but they also need to feel distinctly better than something like a cantrip, as those have no real cost associated with them other than opportunity costs. For the most part, I would say that first level spells are actually in a reasonable spot, but there are certainly a few that meet my criteria of being poorly designed. This video is the second part of my series on poorly designed spells. Check out my other recent video on cantrips if you haven't already. One thing that I really want to be clear about when I'm talking about bad design is that I'm talking about just that. It's design. The intent. How it plays out. A very good spell isn't necessarily poorly designed, and similarly, a bad spell isn't necessarily poorly designed either. It really just comes down to intent, implementation, and reality. Much like my cantrips video, I've made an effort to pick spells that I feel are poorly designed for a variety of reasons though. If you enjoy what I do, consider subscribing to help me reach that goal of 5,000 subs by the end of the month. You can also help support my channel directly for as little as $1 per month if you're so inclined by joining and becoming a member, which also gives you access to some fun perks and helps me make more and better content for you. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Shout out to Julio, yes it's actually pronounced like that, for being my first member and in the warrior tier. Also, be sure to check out my Discord server. There's a lot of great stuff going on there from 1D need discussions to homebrew, and it's been so much fun. The link's in the description below. I'll start strong with one that I just about think that everyone can agree upon, and that is Shield. Shield is available to sorcerers, wizards, hexblade warlocks, and artillerist and battlesmith artificers. It costs one reaction, which is taken when you are hit by an attack or targeted by the magic missile spell, and it lasts for one full round. The text reads, an invisible barrier of magical force appears and protects you. Until the start of your next turn, you have a plus 5 bonus to AC, including against the triggering attack, and you take no damage from Magic Missile. This spell is exceptionally good. I don't know how else to say it. Now I know that I'm going to get comments telling me that it's totally fine, but well, it's not. Yes, the cost of a reaction can be expensive depending on the build that you're playing, but it's often more than justified for its cost. Increasing your armor class by 5 for an entire round at the relatively low cost of a first level spell slot and a reaction is extremely powerful. It's also yet another stake in the ground for the martial caster divide. The given assumption about spellcasters being that they should be less tanky as compared to their martial counterparts is simply trounced upon in recognition of the spell. It's great in the early game when you're most vulnerable and you're only sporting that 1d6 plus constitution hit points, but it actually scales exceptionally well into the late game too, since at that point you just have so many spell slots available to you that the low cost of a first level slot is essentially free. Shield warps the game in a few ways. Firstly, the reinforcement of the martial caster divide that I mentioned earlier, but also that it's just such a good spell that it's almost universally picked, which results in it feeling more like a tax than anything else. You essentially have one less spell slot to play with, because not picking shield kind of feels like a warlock not taking Eldritch Blast. Like sure, you don't have to take it, but it's kind of crazy not to. There's tons of different fixes for shield to make it less absurd. It could just offer a smaller bonus to AC like plus two, which then maybe scales with the spell slot used to cast it. Or, and I think more elegantly, it could only just work for the triggering attack and not the entire round. But in reality, I'm down for just about any change here. The next spell is one that you probably don't think about all that often unless you play in a lot of one shots, and that is Ceremony. Ceremony is just such a baffling spell. In one circumstance, it's completely broken, but in 99.9% .9 of others, it's just kinda useless. I hesitate to even call it a trap because I'm honestly not sure that it is. I think I would just say its design fails on account of it being just way too niche. Now, I do want to be clear about something here because I can kinda already hear the comments. I'm not saying that niche and very specific utility spells are bad or even that they're badly designed. 
you'll notice that something like Longstrider doesn't actually appear on this list. Just because a spell isn't useful all the time doesn't mean that it's badly designed. It just has a specific use case, and that's fine. Again, the inverse of this is also true. It is very possible to have a badly designed utility spell. Just covering all of my bases here. Anyway, Ceremony. It's available to clerics and paladins, it takes one hour to cast, is a ritual, and has a range of touch. The spell text reads, you perform a special religious ceremony that is infused with magic. When you cast a spell, choose one of the following rites, the target of which must be within 10 feet of you throughout the casting. All right, no glaring issues so far until we take a look at some of the options. First is Atonement. This lets you touch a willing creature whose alignment has changed, and if you manage to succeed on a DC 20 insight check, hey, I said the thing, you can revert their alignment. Right off the bat, alignment is mostly a non-issue in 5th edition. It can matter in certain campaigns that put a heavy emphasis on it and in other very specific circumstances, but the reality is that it has just lost most of its relevance in the modern game. But I'm not saying that that's necessarily good or bad. But even if it hadn't, and you are playing a game that's involving alignment that can change, that issue has now just been trivialized down into a single first level spell slot that has a weirdly high DC needed to succeed. It's very mixed messaging. I do understand that alignment was a bigger part of earlier editions and even does have some impacts on 5e, but this just kind of feels like the team wasn't sure how relevant that they wanted to make it in the game. Next is Bless Water. You just touch a vial of water and can change it into holy water, okay? This should be a cantrip at best or fold it into something like purify food and drink. It's such a niche requirement that it's really hard to justify. Yes, holy water can be used to deal some damage against fiends and undead, but the funny part is that clerics and certain paladins can already just create holy water without the use of ceremony. Granted, it does cost 25 gold pieces worth of material though. It's just so odd since instead of using your first level spell slot to create holy water and then make a ranged spell attack to deal 2d6 radiant damage against exclusively fiends or undead, you could just cast Guiding Bolt instead, which deals 4d6 radiant damage to anything and grants advantage on the next attack. I'm gonna go through the next ones a little bit more quickly. Coming of Age essentially lets the target benefit from the Guidance spell for 24 hours, but they can only ever gain this benefit once. As we discussed in my Cantress video last week, they can already more or less do this, but this obviously makes it a little bit less mechanically cheesy, but again, they can only ever gain the effect of this once. Dedication is exactly the same as Coming of Age, except that it potentially grants the effect of the Resistance spell for 24 hours, but again, only once ever. I will say that this isn't as bad, but since it's just for one day and then never again, you better pick the right day to cast it. Funeral Rite makes it so the target can't become undead for seven days, except by means of a wish spell. I guess if you knew that you were going to be facing a creature that can raise undead or has something like Finger of Death repaired, this could be useful, but that does require some amount of meta knowledge and could probably also be folded into something like Protection from Evil and Good which ironically requires holy water as its spell component. Last up is Wedding, which just grants the targets both a plus two to their AC for seven days as long as they remain within 30 feet of each other. They can only benefit from the effect again if they become widowed. This is honestly kind of silly. The plus two is massive, and this is disproportionately powerful in a one-shot, which almost certainly takes less than seven days of in-game time. But even if you're not in a one-shot, your cleric or paladin can probably sacrifice a first level spell slot right before you fight the BBEG to have a couple of weddings. <laughs> Alright, I spent way too much time talking about ceremony, so let's go on to another easy one, Silvery Barbs. This spell is probably the poster child for being an overpowered and poorly designed spell. Silvery Barbs is available to bards, wizards, and sorcerers. It costs one reaction to cast, has a range of 60 feet, and reads, you magically distract the triggering creature and turn its momentary uncertainty into encouragement for another creature. The triggering creature must re-roll the d20 and use the lower roll. You can then choose a different creature you can see within range. You can choose yourself. The chosen creature has advantage on its next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw that it makes within one minute. A creature can be empowered by only one use of this spell at a time. This spell just provides so much value. It's almost always useful. You can cancel a crit and increase your own chance of landing one, or succeeding on a potentially devastating saving throw. Since you also get to use it after you've seen the enemy's roll, the odds of it helping are quite strong, and even if the attack still hits you, you do get the added benefit of gaining advantage on anyone in your party's next d20 test. It's really, really good. 
It crowds out other spells and becomes a default pick. Next up is Sleep. Sleep and a few other spells like Color Spray function really weirdly since they work by targeting pools of available hit points rather than a DC or by making an attack roll. This is one of those spells that when I first read it, I remember thinking how cool and powerful it was and obviously had to have it on any character that I made. The reality is though, it actually is really good at first and maybe second level, but after that it just dramatically falls off in relevance. 5d8 sounds like a really large amount of dice and potential hit points at first, but it's really only about 20 hit points on average, and based on how quickly most monster health scales, it becomes quickly outpaced and even upcasting it doesn't really help all that much. This reason, the fact that it's only good at really early levels and is basically useless later on is part of why I feel that the spell is poorly designed. I'm not entirely opposed to spells that are more potent when you begin your adventure and have their power wane a little bit as you become more proficient in things. The bigger issue that I have here is just the targeting of hit points. At first glance, it seems cool, it's different, it's a fun twist on how you can engage with your spells. I'm totally here for that creativity. The issue though is that it does rely on at least some degree of meta knowledge to either be useful or at least to not be totally useless. You kind of need to have some concept of the amount of hit points that enemies have to make the cast feel worth it, and for me at least, that kind of takes away from some of the magic. Also, what if your DM is using homebrewed creatures, or if they scaled up a monster by adding some hit points? Then even your meta knowledge doesn't hold up. I know some people also play with enemy hit points being revealed, but at that point, this spell kind of has the inverse problem of probably being too potent in the early game. Detect Evil and Good is another spell that you probably don't think about all that much, and probably for the very reason that it's a poorly designed spell. It doesn't actually do what the title suggests it does, that being detecting evil or good. Kind of like find traps. Yes, I know it detects creatures that tend to be associated with good or evil alignments, but that's really not the same. It gives no information on whether a specific creature tends toward being good or evil, or how strongly that they may be aligned with one way or the other. Again, like I mentioned earlier, this is probably a symptom of 5e largely doing away with the alignment system, but still holding on to remnants of it, but in ways that don't really make a lot of sense. I want to be clear again here that I'm not saying that the spell is necessarily bad. It might be a bit niche, but that's okay for a spell that's largely utility focused, but it doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do, and that results in a spell that's a little bit misleading and has a lot more potential. Next up is Goodberry. This one has been talked about a lot, including by me, so I won't spend too much time on it. Goodberry is available to druids and rangers, it costs one action to cast, has a range of touch, and reads, up to ten berries appear in your hand and are infused with magic for the duration. A creature can use its action to eat one berry. Eating a berry restores one hit point, and the berry provides enough nourishment to sustain a creature for one day. The berries lose their potency if they have not been consumed within 24 hours of the casting of this spell. This is a spell that also seems fairly innocuous on the face of it. Ten berries that only heal one hit point seems pretty meaningless. The real issue though is this second half of the spell that says that just one berry provides enough nourishment to sustain a creature for a full day. Now sure, in most campaigns or adventures, this isn't likely to be a big deal, but if you're playing in any campaign that does put some amount of emphasis on survival and needing those necessary resources, like the first chunk of Tomb of Annihilation, this single first level spell completely undermines that. It obliterates a potential element of the game by virtue of its very existence, and that just feels like poor design. It's an answer in and of itself. All that's really needed to do here is just remove the second part of the spell, and it hurts basically no one. The people not playing in games where food matters won't care, and the people actually running survival campaigns don't have their game trivialized by a single first level spell. I do have an honorable mention, but before I get to that, the last spell that I want to talk about is in my favorite category of poorly designed spells, and those are the ones that feel like traps. I find them so fascinating because, in most cases at least, it's not like the design team actually went out of their way to make a spell that seems good but actually isn't, but rather they probably actually tried really hard to make a spell that's interesting and has some naturally compelling nature, but it doesn't actually work out all that well. The trap spell that I want to look at here is Witchbolt. This spell initially looks appealing, before you look at it too closely that is. Witchbolt is available to sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards, it costs one action to cast, has a range of 30 feet, and also requires your concentration. The spell text reads, a beam of crackling blue energy lances out toward an enemy creature within range, forming a sustained arc of lightning between you and the target. 
make a ranged spell attack against that creature. On a hit, the target takes 1d12 lightning damage, and on each of your turns for the duration, you can use your action to deal 1d12 lightning damage to the target automatically. The spell ends if you use your action to do anything else. The spell also ends if the target is ever outside of the spell's range, or if it has total cover from you. At higher levels, when you cast a spell using a spell slot of 2nd level or higher, the initial damage increases by 1d12 for each spell slot above 1st. The spell seems really appealing because it essentially allows you to convert it into a cantrip for what appears to be the cost of a single spell slot, giving you access to 1d12 lightning damage per turn for quote unquote free. The problem is that firstly, 1d12 damage isn't all that great, even for a first level spell slot. There's cantrips like Poison Spray that also deal 1d12. The upside here is that it's lightning, which isn't as commonly resisted, so I guess there's that. The trap part here is that free casting part though. The spell requires you to maintain concentration on it to keep it up. That's already a steep charge for something that's ultimately only dealing 1d12 damage and basically letting you cast a slightly better lightning bolt flavored poison spray. The thing is though, that it's worse than that. It's like super concentration. The spell text includes a part that reads, the spell ends if you use your action to do anything else. That is a really high cost. Even with regular concentration spells, you can continue casting other spells that don't require concentration. With this though, you can't. You can't make a weapon attack, you can't dash, you can't do anything else with your action other than keep casting Witch Bolt. That is rough. But then, to make things even worse, it also creates a little bit of an anti-synergy with itself. It having concentration incentivizes you to take cover or to move away so you aren't taking the damage, but it only has a range of 30 feet and the spell ends immediately if you go outside of that range, or if the enemy does for that matter. So now you're stuck concentrating on a spell, you can't do anything else with your action, you can't move away or hide or take cover, and are basically just casting poison spray from a little bit farther. Also, upcasting this is insane, since only the initial damage gets the boost. I feel like I get what they were trying to do here though. The idea of continually casting a spell is cool, and the counterplay between maintaining concentration and staying close could have been an interesting idea, but instead, it just feels bad. Lastly, I want to give an honorable mention to Magic Missile. I was very close to including it, but ultimately decided against it. It's just so consistent, it has amazing range, it always hits, it deals a damage type that basically nothing resists, it also deals very reasonable average damage, and it's a staple pick for basically every wizard ever. You know what, actually, <laughs> I've convinced myself. I'm actually gonna go ahead and include it on this list. It's not an honorable mention anymore. I don't know what it is about this spell though, for some reason it still feels wrong to include it, but I've included other less egregious spells, so I kind of feel like I have to. This is probably the hottest take on this list. Overall, I think most first level spells are actually pretty reasonably well designed. They are really fun and interesting and do a great job at preparing players for what is to come in the future and what they can expect in the game. Let me know what other spells you think could be added and which I got wrong. I'm sure I'm going to hear all about that in the comments below. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Consider subscribing to help me reach that goal of 5,000 subs by the end of the month. Come hang out in my Discord server, but otherwise, take care.